What do cops, cab drivers, and cabbages have in common? Ever heard of the condom king? Get the answers in this episode of the Overpopulation Podcast. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast, where we tirelessly make overshoot and overpopulation common knowledge. That's the first step in right-sizing the scale of our human footprint so that it is in balance with life on Earth, enabling all species to thrive. I'm Nandita Bajaj, co-host of the podcast and executive director of Population Balance. And I'm Alan Ware, co-host of the podcast and researcher with Population Balance, a nonprofit that collaborates with experts and other organizations to educate about the impacts of human overpopulation and overconsumption on the planet, people, and animals. And before we move on to today's guest, we've got some listener feedback. This letter is from Jack from England. He says, your podcast has truly opened my eyes and ears to pronatalism and parenthood and had a profound impact on my life. Big thanks from across the pond. I think I have binged on episodes 66, 70, and 71 about five times each. So thanks for offering such a great platform for discussion. The societal pressure to procreate was a bit of an issue for me, and I was struggling to navigate these feelings until I found the podcast. With the shocking news from the U.S. these past couple of days, it seems like there is a fair way to go, but hopefully this can become a catalyst for change and growing awareness of population balance. And we have a letter here from Victoria who's in Germany. Hello, I have just discovered your website through the Overpopulation Podcast, which I also recently discovered. I have long seen the connection between overpopulation and the destruction of the natural world and wondered why no one openly discussed this. I am thrilled to find that there are a few who do. Well, thank you for those nice comments, Jack and Victoria. If you have feedback or guest recommendations to share, you can write to us using the contact form on our site, populationbalance.org, or by emailing us at podcast at populationbalance.org. And now, on to our guest interview. Affectionately known in Thailand as Mr. Condom, today's guest, Michai Viravaidya, is the founder and chair of the Population and Community Development Association. Since 1974, he has initiated community-based family planning services, innovative poverty reduction and rural education programs, large-scale rural development and environmental programs, as well as groundbreaking HIV AIDS prevention activities throughout Southeast Asia. To ensure financial sustainability for PDA, 16 for-profit companies have been established that are affiliated with PDA and are mandated to put funds towards the nonprofit organization. Companies and businesses include the popular Cabbages and Condoms restaurant chain, the Birds and Bees Resort, and a new Cabbages and Condoms Cafe. He has held key positions as Thailand's cabinet spokesman, the minister of the office of the prime minister, a senator, as well as chairman of several of Thailand's largest government-owned enterprises. In 2008, the Bamboo School was established by the Michai Virabhaidya Foundation to be a lifelong learning center for students, as well as other citizens, and a hub for social and economic advancement. For his efforts in various development endeavors, Michai Viravaidya has been acclaimed with numerous awards, recognition, and honorary doctoral degrees, as well as the United Nations Gold Peace Medal, one of Asia Week's 20 Great Asians, the United Nations Population Award, and one of Time Magazine's Asian Heroes Award. Michai and PDA have recently been the recipient of the Bill and Melinda Gates Award for Global Health, the Skoll Awardees for Social Entrepreneurship, and the Prince Mahidol Award for Public Health. And now on to our discussion with Mr. Michai. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast, Mr. Michai Virabhaidya. We are so excited to have you here. You are a legend in the field of family planning and sustainable population advocacy. And I'm sure you well know that advocates from all around the world look to you as a shining example for what can be done in the field. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. So, Michai, we would like to start with a bit of your background to get to understand what motivated 
you in this direction. So what was your background as a child and as a young man? And what influence did that background have on the course that you've taken in life? Well, as a child, I was just an ordinary child with very few toys because after the war, Mm. there were very few toys. So I had to make my own toys. So that's one part of being, I guess you can say, sort of creative out of doing mud into buffaloes rather than buying them. That's the first one. The second one is that both my parents were doctors and they had a clinic in town and where they charged the patients, but they also had a room at home for those who could not pay, but to come and get free service. So I saw this uh, social enterprise approach whereby you give and you can also take some. And so I learned that is that, you know, when you water a tree, the grass can also get greener. So that, that was a lesson. And also uh, in terms of empathy, I was sitting in a car with my mother. I was about seven, eight years old. And we stopped at a traffic light and there was an old woman walking across with baskets on her back. And then the lights turned green. The car next to us tooted the horn. And my mother said, it's a shame that man has money for a car. He should go down and help her because the woman has no car and she has to work at this old age. So that's the attitude that I I was brought up with. Mm. Then I went to Australia, 13, went to boarding school there. It was a good, good boarding school called Geelong Grammar. Prince Charles went there, not that it did much for him. I liked the school. It was a boarding school. And I liked the fact that fair play was part of life. Mm. that you don't cheat, you move on. And then I was a, a president of the Students Association of Thailand. So I had to go around Australia speaking on Thailand. That's how I learned about the country, what was going on. So what experiences caused you to begin advocating for family planning in Thailand? Well, so when I finished my degree in economics and commerce, came back to Thailand and was asked to join the Ministry of Commerce. I visited them and I didn't feel that was what I liked. Uh, I was asked to join an oil company, very high pay. And that did not appeal because my mother said that we didn't send you there to come and work for an oil company then work half the day and play golf the other half. We <laughs> want you to do something useful. And so the, the third one was the National Economic and Social Development Board, which is the planning authority of the whole country. And I knew that I would be able to see my own country. So I applied and got a job there. And I was in the evaluation division. And during that time, I had to travel in many parts of the country to see the progress of the activities going on, be it dams, hospitals, roads. There weren't many social activities going on and report on them. But while out there, I saw children in the villages everywhere. And I wondered, the first one I wondered was that the people had no participation structure in the projects, Mm -hmm. despite the fact that it was for them. Second was that children everywhere, and I came back and worked with some people at the university and felt that seven kids per family was not at all sustainable. Population growth rate of 3.3% would double every 25 years. We just said that we had to do something about it. So in a group, we proposed to the prime minister, and I was in the office of the prime minister, proposed to him, and he said, no, no, go back to your professors and do it again. This five years in a row. And then I realized that university is not a very good ally to Mm. change attitude Mm. in government. So I went to an editor of magazine who later became prime minister and asked him to chair a meeting where all the media people were invited for two days. And after they finished, they they spent time writing and organizing activities in the media. Mm. And within six months, the government changed its attitude. So it just shows that you have to use a different partner also. You've been very good at gaining trust of local people in these campaigns and not doing a top-down approach, but a very much bottom-up. And you've noted that big issues from corruption to climate change center around changing people first. What do you mean by that? I felt that for family planning to work, the average person must understand the concept and ask questions, and they need their contemporaries to work with to ask. So that's how I started off the community-based distribution of contraceptives, asking the villagers which person in their village would be the most trusted person to supply you with information, contraceptives. And they said it was the local shopkeeper. And before then, I was in the National Economic Development Board. I was also asked to teach at Thomasart University because this has happened because they had short supply of university teachers. Mm-hmm. So I did that. In addition to that, I had a newspaper column every Monday 
on developments. I reported on the development issues, including population, corruption, and so on. And then I had a radio program six nights a week, 9.30. Wow. And then finally, I acted in a soap opera as a leading actress for three years. But this is in addition to what I was doing. So I did five things, but I think the most relevant part is that it taught me about communications. It taught me how university worked. Right. It taught me how the civil service works. It taught me how the newspaper works. It taught me how the radio works and taught me how the television works. So I used oh. the newspaper column for the more uh, intellectually advanced group. Mm -hmm. And the radio program was for the middle, mostly for the university types mm -hmm. who are still students. And then the soap opera was for the proletariat, so to speak, for the everyone else. And they took the best-selling book and had a, a play for six months, two nights every month. So I did that for three years, apart from regular working. So <laughs> there was no time for anything else. So that's how I learned, not so much at university, yeah. but by being involved in the area of communications and seeing how people act and react. You founded the Population and Community Development Association in 1974, and its goal from the outset has been to reduce poverty through both development initiatives and family planning programs. PDA has operated with the belief that local people are best suited to shape and sustain their own development. How did that focus on local people and local culture inform your family planning efforts? Well, I left the government to start family planning, mm -hmm. uh, population and community development association, not just family planning. We need more than family planning. You know, you have the Planned Parenthood Association that tells right. you that you're going to do one thing. I said, no, that's why we call it our population and community development association. Right. Across the board, we need more than that. So, but we started off with family planning. We also realized that we need new allies. So we were able to train 320,000 rural school teachers. Wow. They'd be involved in family planning. Uh, they could use it in their lessons, whereby it can be in geography, in maths. For instance, if, if a, a farmer has 10 acres of land and has 10 kids, every child has one acre. But if it's right. five kids, you get more. Two kids, you get more. So that was very simple. And we came up with a new alphabet. You know, <laughs> why Why do we leave, you know, A for apple, B for bird, C for cat? You know, we say B for bird, C for condoms, I for IUD, <laughs> B for vasectomy, <laughs> This should have been used. And again, you know, kids remember. And that's why we attacked the kids. And so we also had a family planning song. And the kids sang these family planning songs after the national anthem when they're meeting at school. So everyone uh, welcomed and worked with us. So in the end, the issue of family planning was accepted. And of course, uh, we had women who were very happy to have their sterilization, but not the men. They were afraid of going to hospital. So the government asked us, can you help to fix that up? So we found out that they were afraid of going to the hospital. Right. Mm. And so we said, well, we'll have to do vasectomy outside of hospital. So we came up with mobile van, air conditioning, with music for them. And then we went around to all the, our distributors who got the women to convince their husbands and bring them in. And then we had a vasectomy. And sometimes we got them to come to Bangkok and we showed them all around Bangkok, the Imo Buddha Temple and so on followed by a vasectomy. It made it fun, interesting. <laughs> and we also, for the men, we had a special vasectomy festivals. Wow. Many days. <clears throat> for instance, on the king's birthday, we had the Father's Day vasectomy. People come and we ask children to bring their fathers for vasectomy. And many children did. <laughs> and we, we also had the 4th of July vasectomy to help America. In America, we're helping <laughs> everyone. We thought we'd better help America too. And the media from America came out and said, why are you doing this? America didn't ask for it. I said, I'm just doing the same. You've been giving stuff to all sorts of people when they didn't ask for it. So, so that went. And again, we use humor all the way in. Right. And it's very yeah. difficult to get angry with you when you can laugh at certain things. So basically we used ordinary approach to it and it was two way. You must allow the people to participate. And so when, when you're help, helping the people, we also got them to be involved in helping them the project or the process. So that was the general activity in family planning. The number of children came down from seven to under two, population growth rate from 3.3 down to 0.4. So That's that was incredible. You also brought in Buddhist monks as allies early in the campaign. Did it take much work convincing these monks? 
in the Philippines, the Catholic Church was against family planning. And I mm -hmm. didn't know whether Buddhism was against family planning. So I asked the monks who could not answer the questions. So I got some university people to do research into the Buddhist scriptures. We found many, many positive quotations, uh -huh. the most being many births cause suffering. Therefore, to prevent birth uh -huh. is to prevent suffering. And uh -huh. I made a prayer fan, round one, where they sit in front of prayer, and, and I sent it to all the temple. So when people come to the temple and for a funeral or whatever it is, the monk is saying, chanting a prayer, they see the message, many births cause suffering. So we Interesting. Used that. And the monks didn't mind. And then the villagers said, look, could you go one step further, please? Would it be all right for you to get the monks to bless the contraceptives with holy water? <laughs> I said, well, well, I didn't know. So I went <laughs> to, to see a monk in Bangkok and he said, yes. So he came to the office and I was holding a bowl of holy water and he was sprinkled on all the contraceptives. <laughs> this was then a country and all the temples around the villages started doing the same thing. So in other words, we got not only the answer that Buddhism was not against it, it was for and we used it. And right. we also went to see the Supreme Patriarch, which is, the, I guess, equivalent to the Pope in Rome. Mm. Mm. This is in Buddhism. And asked him to sign a photo of himself to be sent to the country. And he said, we wish the community-based family planning services much success and luck. So then that became very clearly a support from the Supreme Patriarch and religion as a whole. You've used some really creative strategies to destigmatize the use of condoms in Thailand. You used condoms in water balloon blowing competitions. You enlisted taxi drivers in handing out condoms. You even got police to hand out condoms, and that became known as cops and rubbers. You, in fact, came to be known as the condom king of Thailand. And condoms became known as meat chais. You were able to use humor in a family planning campaign to a degree that no one had ever done before. What sparked the creativity and humor that you used in these condom campaigns? We had for five years trained 320,000 school teachers and kids wow. were blowing condoms in school in relay races, <laughs> using condoms and so on. So it became a very natural thing. We even had blowing condoms in temples and in, and in mosques. So, you know, we showed respect, but we went ahead. So those were the things we did. And the other one is that I did not argue with people. In the beginning, we had some mm. diamond-fingered ladies who were the upper part of society who think that they think for society. And they said, Micha, you are corrupting the youth by doing all of this. Right. And I said, look, I don't think so. Hmm. Please advise me. So mm -hmm. I went to them and got them to feel that they're the boss. And I went back and did exactly the same thing. And they didn't do anything to me. So the whole idea is don't clash, join, apologize, and continue mm -hmm. doing it. In traffic, we call it a cops and rubbers program. <laughs> right. <laughs> didn't you also have a restaurant? Or do you still have that yes, restaurant? Yes, restaurant for cabbages and condoms, where you come and you see condoms all over, decorations, and we uh, have even condom salad. But <laughs> some people come down and say, well, I have a friend. Could you put in some real condoms just for this evening? <laughs> so it became a, a relaxed part. Yeah. And so people from around the world came. They couldn't believe their eyes. Took pictures, sent to their friends. So yes. it became a very well-known restaurant. And helped to earn money as a social enterprise right. for the PDA. I mean, what an incredible idea to use humor to destigmatize the use of contraceptives. Because around the world, there is still so much stigma around talking about sex and contraception and family planning because it's seen as such a private affair. But what was surprising to us was the uptake in contraceptives and condom use was just as high for the least educated citizens in Thailand as it was for the more educated one. Did you find that it was just because the norms were shifting and it was just easier for people to talk about it, even if they didn't go through school? Well, people had known me. The right. ones that watched the soap opera had watched me for three years. Right. Okay. Uh, the leading right. actor, very nice person always. So they me. <laughs> That so helps. The, the role in the television helped. So they knew me. There was no right. unknown quality about me. That was why they felt relaxed about it. And I didn't uh, argue with anybody. 
<laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Your all your experience in those institutions, media, university, newspaper, TV, and then you were able to work laterally with school teachers and village people. That's quite a unique combination of abilities that you developed. Can you give us some idea of the AIDS problem in Thailand uh, at the beginning and how you went about addressing that? When AIDS came along, what we had done in family planning was used to push this. And I got some money from Rockefeller and mm -hmm. to print at cost, uh, video tapes and so on, and cassette tapes or radio. Went to see the minister in charge of broadcasting and said, no, it would ruin tourism. Oh, wow. Um, so obviously our philosophy was take no as a question, never no as an answer. And think outside the box, not only the box, think outside the fence as well, and make mm -hmm. sure you're sustainable. So I went to see the commander in chief of the army. He's far more powerful than the minister of broadcasting. And I said to him, here's the situation of HIV infection in Thailand. Your soldiers are being infected. Men mm -hmm. of age 19 to 21, which is military recruitment age, they're being infected all over, 14% in certain parts of the countries. Mm -hmm. We will continue to expand because nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. We need help. We need to create understanding because there was no cure. And he was quite, quite taken back and he said, okay, what can I do to help? I said, I'd like to wire 300 radio stations and two television networks. And I provided <laughs> the software funded by Rockefeller. It's probably the best money they've ever spent on all radio stations. It went into Laos and Cambodia also. So people wow. heard about it the first time. And soon after that, we had a new prime minister and he asked me to join his cabinet. And I was the architect and I asked him to be the chairman of the National AIDS Committee. This is total war. Minister of Health is never strong enough. So I became the deputy and the Minister of Health was the other deputy. And so we worked along together and public information was removed from the Ministry of Health and given to the public relations department of the office of prime minister to be really wow. strong. Because health people have never been very strong at getting the message across. That's why we have so many sick people. Right. And so your communications strategy that you learn from all of these extracurricular activities is really what ended up helping in the yeah, end. Yeah, we went further than that. For instance, we had policemen, I already told you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We trained the teachers again, but we also went to the university and asked the university students mm -hmm. for, to join. We trained them and asked them to go back to their old school and train their younger brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And the upper high school trained the junior high school and the junior high school trained the primary school kids. And one day at the end of it all, Every single primary school student had a packet of AIDS information and condom mm. that they gave out to every household, every household in the whole country. Wow. So we said it was total war and we had to act it. And there yeah. was an increase of 50 fold in the budget of AIDS that was given to mm. all the ministries, even the, the judges had to be trained because when they're in court, they have to mention something about AIDS mm. just to save life. So that, that was what happened also. And so the university was very, very helpful. And the students from the university went out and taught this in the schools. Some parents said to me, Michai, you're doing this, you're corrupting the youth. Let me give you an example. When your child is about 22, there will be two possible events. And both of them have flowers. One is at the graduation of your child with the university. Mm -hmm. Second is at the funeral of your child. There's also mm -hmm. flowers. You choose. Mm -hmm. That's and there was powerful. no cure. Yeah. No right. And we then had a, in family planning, sorry, let me jump back. The, the villagers said, you know, we came up with a slogan, many children make you poor. When they had few children, we said, like, it doesn't make us rich either. <laughs> so can, we need to do development. So I got some money and started off a, the uh, village micro credit plan. We call it the non-pregnancy agricultural credit. And the villagers yeah. said that only women who were not pregnant can borrow because we don't have enough money for everyone. Oh, wow. And, and if you borrow, you get raised two pigs at a time twice a year. Or if you have not pregnant for two years, you get three pigs to raise at a time, six pigs. And if you do it in three years, four years, you have eight pigs. And then we form a cooperative for you. So mm. in other words, it went on from family planning to that. And then, then the micro credit expanded into what we call the Village Development Bank, which is a micro credit operated by villages. And were you trying to encourage birth spacing when you said if you oh, don't? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We asked them, you know, do you got all the children you have? No. We said, what are we going to do? We don't yeah. know what to do. I said, ah, 
I have a method, a pill hmm. that can space your child just like your coconut trees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we didn't say them to stop. But right. what happened is that maternal child health was improved so that survival of the child was strong. So if you yes. have very low survival of the child, forget about family planning. Yeah. It's going to be a maternal mm-hmm. child health program. So that went parallel. And so that they realized that the children that they have will survive. So you don't have to have eight people. Like yeah. For instance, my father's family, he had eight brothers and sisters. Five mm-hmm. died, only three left. Mm-hmm. But today, that's not the case. So that right. helped us a lot. And even with your AIDS advocacy work, your efforts were so successful that the World Bank estimated that there were over 7 million additional yeah. HIV cases that were prevented, prevented from happening. And the UN AIDS said yeah. there was, during the 12 years beginning in 1990, 12 years since, many governments, the number of new infections fell by 90%, 90%. Hmm. That was UN AIDS. And then the World Bank said that they had done it, and it was number 7.7 million. And as of the last three years, they had said the number had reached 10 million. Wow. Imagine yes. had we taken advice of the, the minister, what would happen? Right. right. So in other words, you don't have to fight people. You don't have to agree with the wrong decision, but find new partners. Yeah, right. such a great strategy. Did you find that your efforts were... Uh, replicated in other communities or countries? Other countries mm-hmm. came and asked. I don't know how much they did after they had training here. Yes. We had trained about 24 countries mm-hmm. about in both family planning and HIV infection and development. Mm-hmm. And what we also did after the family planning and the age, we also introduced a social enterprise for NGOs to also have a business arm. Mm-hmm. Whereby we have two types of business arms. One is where it's maximization of profit. We work with those who have lots of cash. And the other one is optimization, where we work with those who have little cash, poor. And so we use the maximization profits, like our restaurant, to help fund activities in the villages. We also right. help to set up in partnership with companies. So the next one was the reducing poverty by partnering with the companies. The government does, doesn't know how to make money. They only know how to take money. So right. if you get to go to the government... It's, Guaranteed failure. So I went to the business sector who know how to make money, who have spare money, and asked them to join in to partner with the poor village. So we had lots of them joining in. And any money that was to be spent was to be spent on building up a microcredit loan fund to be sustainable. So for every $3, they planted a tree. So it wasn't that the villagers took it for granted. They also contributed the trees. Oh. And so from the giver, the company... You have the tree, and then you have the microcredit loan fund, and it's still going on. The trees are still alive today. Microcredit loan fund is still going on today. So mm-hmm. the companies felt, and the giver felt good about it because it's just not going out because people who are in the business like to see money grow. Yes. They don't right. like to see money disappear like when you give it to the Red Cross. Right. So, so, so that was was an important one. So we got, in, the, in each village, we had the village bank, operated by gender-specific, half women at least, Mm -hmm. to be on the committee to do all the lending. And Mm -hmm. those are still going on today. Some have grown a lot. And so the social enterprise helps the villagers to borrow money, to earn a business and to grow. As if your family planning and aid successes weren't enough, you then went on to create a major educational innovation program with your Michai Bamboo School. Could you describe what those schools are and what motivated you to start them? Well, uh, we decided that education was now the final one because Mm -hmm. you've got to stop the births, stop the deaths, try to stop the poverty. But for it to really work is to go to the school and use the school as a platform for social and economic advancement in villages surrounding the school. Right. And that's what we've done. And the United Nations said that this is one of the most creative, innovative schools in the whole world. Yeah. Because the kids get to operate the school. We have a student government. They do all the buying, everything from food to vehicles. They have the other students interview incoming students. They also interview applying teachers. And they also evaluate the teachers. Yeah, that's amazing. How do you go about creating young people who are so competent? 
we train them, we let them see what's good, what's wrong, what's right. Yeah. And uh, generate, we've now had 12 years of it, and many have gone ahead and done, done extremely well. So when they apply to university, people notice them. They're very, very mature. And people also, they're very polite, and they're always on time, they work hard. And we at school, we have a bridge, which is over a small canal, and opposite the clubhouse. Whenever they walk by, they must say good morning or good afternoon or good evening. It's called a sort of welcome bridge. So that if they meet you five times a day, it's five good morning and good afternoon. <laughs> so it's not just once, it's a continuous. And yeah. so that we pay the school fees in community service and tree planting because we oh, want to wow. raise the level of goodness. At the moment, money is everything. Hmm. We want to raise the level of goodness so that people can see one of the desires in life should also to do good. Right. So we get them to be also sit in wheelchairs one day a month, everyone, right. to mm. learn about the life of people in a wheelchair and to see what wheelchair life in other countries are. Huh? And they're shocked that in Thailand it's miserable. You can't get a job. So they said, look, we have agriculture. We now have wheelchair. So let's come up with wheelchair agriculture. So they created a cement ring that's used for, for toilets, Mm. and then raise the ground and then sit in a wheelchair and you can do your vegetable from a wheelchair. So mm. that's not from the UN, but from a 10th grade student. And so that's oh, been wow. going on for all the schools. We also get the deaf to come and teach us sign language. There are 400,000 Thais to whom we cannot speak. Mm. It's not good. So we right. say, come on, we want to learn. So they come, they teach us first, and then we teach them what they want. We teach them swimming, agriculture. And now we've helped these assume to have a farm and to have loan fund for the agriculture they're making money then they finish grade 12 they can grow vegetables at home mm -hmm. we're now doing also um, tissue culture laboratory with them so that this can be more sophisticated and the other one that is interesting is that these deaf students and wheelchair bound students are training elderly people to grow vegetables so it's income security and food security for the elderly by students, including children who have difficulties in hearing and in walking. Wow. In other words, we turn it around. These are the people who usually mm. get given help. No, we get them to do the helping, you know, to try and turn it around. Right. Mm. And do your students come back to you and thank you for the, the kindness and caring that you helped instill in them, like the wheelchair and skipping a meal? Don't they skip a meal every week? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, we, we limit the telephone use to... One hour per That's impressive. Week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because the telephone use is by kids is for fun, not for education. Even yeah. France now has outlawed mobile telephones in school. Well. But anyway, and then to learn about hunger, you cannot learn from a book. You cannot learn from a video. You have to learn from being hungry. So on uh, a Saturday evening after you've had your mobile telephone, you do not eat. And then realize that, wow, yeah. this is how people who are hungry feel. So we mm. must try to do everything we can not to make them hungry. Right. right. Yeah, it's such an impressive, the empathy, the kindness combined with the decision-making, democratic, uh, being a citizen of the school and making all these responsible and they go decisions. To, they, every Wednesday, they go out to the villages. We have 16 and villages they, surrounding the school. Oh. At the moment, the main one is to help food security and income security for the elderly. And they're working in partnership with grandchildren so that the grandchildren will eventually, maybe when they finish school, to wish to stay home. At the moment, we have 6 million kids who might call temporary orphans, mm. their parents in town, because they finished school, they didn't have any skill at all, so they went to sell their labor in the factory in town. And then before long, they send their children, the babies, home to grandparents. But that's not the best way uh, right. to, to raise a child. And to me, I say it's an avoidance of human rights. It's an abuse of human rights hmm. of the woman to be a mother. So that's another right. angle that we, we have to do. In other words, stop the migration so that we're putting a lot of very good agriculture and other activities into the villages, starting at the school. So now we're working with about 200 schools. Really? They've come to yeah. us and we've went to the private sector to get money and doing it because the school partnership project where we train the teachers, put in the farm, a loan fund for the students, loan fund for the parents. We must get the students, the school, to help parents out of poverty, not put them into poverty. 
Right. right. Yeah. The, the prime minister in 2017 <clears throat> urged all schools in Thailand should emulate the Michai bamboo schools, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they understand it and they like it. And they, yeah. now the Senate has asked us to expand more. We, we can't find the money, of course, at mm-hmm. this stage. Right. Uh, one province in Chiang Rai in the north, 530 schools, they have to sign an agreement. The whole province will do it. In other words, I wow. don't have to push it. They're coming ahead. Now I'm sitting with the Senate to get them to influence the state enterprises, with mm-hmm. them to give some money out of their profits towards this project. So oh, that's we'll amazing. What happens. Yeah. Yeah, the division between school and community is so unnecessary. And Yeah, no, now the school becomes a part of the community. Right. And uh, many of the villagers said they, we never thought that the school could mean so much to us. <laughs> right. We have an evaluation network that we borrow from Professor Cantrell, self-anchoring striving scale. We call it the bamboo ladder. We use it to evaluate. Mm. And you said that the school is heavily involved with promoting the UN's SDGs. You've noted the SDGs have a major omission in not including the need for family planning. We wholeheartedly agree with that. Have you had any conversations with the people at the UN or other organizations about this? You know, we were doing the, it already. We didn't yeah. know the UN had SDG. <laughs> right, right. And then when they said, ah, Yes. And so they celebrated UN Day at our school. They, then what an they honor. They us to bring 16 schools in to sign an agreement they call the compact hmm. between UN and, and 16 schools. I didn't get the director of the school, but the students to sign the agreement with the UN. And so now we're going on with that. But we said that 17 is not enough. So we need four more. In yeah. Thailand, we've added oh. one, no corruption. So it's good hmm. corruption, money is not going to get down there. Right. Two, the sense of sharing mm. so that if people who have have to share by knowledge or money, the third <laughs> rule of law, you must obey the rules, obey the law. And the mm. final one is that family security, family welfare and family planning. You have mm. to help your family. Forget about the government. The government can support, but not much. So you have to be the main one. Otherwise, we sit back and say, it's the government's job. Well, we would love to see more of these bamboo schools in countries like Canada and the U.S. If you know people in the education area from Canada can come out, you can right. also send some students to spend a bit of time with us. No problem. Mm. Yeah. Or even volunteers. No problem. We'll provide food accommodation, and they will see what education at the peripheral area can be. Right. For instance, one school in America, the kids came, mm. wow. and the parents. And they went back and they convinced the school board that when they're recruiting teachers, they get some students to sit with them to also Mm. ask questions. Why not? I'm trying to get every government department and every company to have a youth advisory committee. Get tomorrow's leaders to start giving ideas today rather than listening to all people's ideas. So use the young people. Every government department needs them. Yeah, the young people don't get taken seriously and then... They respond accordingly. <laughs> they're not uh, taking on responsibility because they're not trusted with it. And you have a great history of trusting people at all levels of society and ages and occupations to take matters into their own hands, make decisions for themselves. And then when people outside say, so for instance, they interview for university. They also interview the lecturers at the interviewing them. Said, look, mm. if I'm to spend four years at this university, I need to find out more about the university and, and more about the professors and lecturers at the university. Yeah. They ask questions. And environmentally, you've been, well, planting trees, right, as part of what the kids yeah, do, do for their tuition. Do, the family together must do 800 hours mm. year and plant 800 trees. Wow. So in other words, by the time they finish from grade 7 to grade 12, they have 5,000 trees planted. Wow. Oh. And you said that's in lieu of a tuition, right? They don't pay a fee, but they do community but, service yeah, instead. That's, that's the school fees. By yeah. doing good. What a, because other schools, what a model. The school fees you pay, that doesn't do any good to society. And what are the major environmental problems in Thailand, would you say? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Thailand has, in early days, cut down the forest, trees, okay. and Bangkok. And now they're much more aware of it. Okay. And so they're burning 
of the rice fields after harvest uh, is being reduced very severely. These trees are much needed, the trees they're yeah, planting. Yeah. And that's why we get people to plant trees. And in many schools, we hope to get a child to plant one for every birthday in the family. Ah, okay. Mm. And I notice your agriculture, you do it with limited land, or they're doing it in yeah. pots, it looks like. Yeah, we used pot. to create our land, <clears throat> use little water, little land, and little labor. It's very good for elderly people. Yeah, right. If you're growing rice, you get five baht per square meter of income, which is five baht is 25 cents. Okay. US. Per square meter. But if you do bean sprouts, you get 20,000 baht per wow. square meter per year. 20,000 baht. <laughs> wow. Gosh. So in so. other words, we should get them to understand that when you're growing something, youth arithmetic in the school, how much per square meter. Right. Growing this vegetable, this vegetable, this. Think before you plant rather than just plant. Yeah. Yeah. The science and math that the students can apply the same to time, growing. Yeah. Things. yeah. And benefiting the community. We want to make the lessons more interesting because I was always very bored with <laughs> dull teachers. So I said, well, let's make it more interesting. <clears throat> yeah. And you said the students also work with the elderly in the schools in this kind of symbiotic so relationship. We bring, we bring the elderly in, mm -hmm. we use the school as their clubhouse. Oh, okay. it, it's their country club. So they come in once a week. They get to see what we do. We've trained them and so on. And they can sit in class if they want to. They just spend the day there. And we have a van, a big van that takes them out, you know, one area at a time. Are the students still at the school when the elderly people come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They, they sometimes sit in class with the students hmm. and the yeah. students teach them agriculture after 2.30 p.m. They can right. come in the afternoon or they can come in the morning and they can get to see. Most of them don't know how school works, the modern school. And I wanted to go back to your the family planning program in Thailand. You had such great success in bringing the population growth rate down from, you said, 3.3% to 0.4%. What is the situation with the family planning in Thailand now? Well, now it's, it's mostly to do with disease and early pregnancy, prevention of Yes. Most people are aware of family planning. They know the contraceptives. Yeah. And they are using it well? Oh, sure. That's why we our population was so low. Yeah. It's not yeah. from praying. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. And now they say, blame me for having created so many elderly people. You don't have <laughs> enough in the workforce. I said, right. there's a mistake there. Yeah. What you have done is mistakenly mark at age 60 as retirement. No, don't retire. Don't insult yeah. people. Let them continue working. That's how we get the elderly to grow vegetables for the income so they return to the workforce. Yes. And then the figures, you know, out of 15 million who are 60 and above, you have 10 more million added to the workforce. Right. And then we have the budget in the Ministry of Education in billions and billions mm -hmm. for school lunches. Mm -hmm. And we're asking the school now to buy the vegetables from the elderly. So we don't need a new budget. The budget is already there. Just don't buy all it from the merchant, buy it from the elderly. So that's not being pushed by the Senate also. Oh, right. that's great. Do you get much um, politicians and economists worried about population decline and that we have to increase our birth rates? And do you hear no, much well, of I, that? I tell them that they said, oh, some people say, well, we must get encouraged people to have more children. I said, in no country in the world has it worked that people are having babies for the government. <laughs> right. We have yeah. migrants, give them citizenship. Young people, give them citizenship. Mm -hmm. Thailand's yeah. made up of all sorts of people already. So yes. in other words, we don't have such a large number of people who are elderly. Just yeah. don't, right. so don't count at 60, count at 70. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think they might adopt a program like yours? Oh, I We're believe so, because the Senate's taken up very seriously. Oh, great. I'm going to push for it because we have the budget already. Billions yeah. and billions for school lunches. Wow. We have 32,000 schools. Mm -hmm. Wow. We have mm -hmm. 320 billion yeah. for school lunch. So yeah. just use it to buy some of it from yeah. the elderly. You've solved the problem. Yeah. Right. And it's That's not genius. done by the Ministry of Social Welfare, but done by the Ministry of Education. So I'm trying to ask every government department and organization, whatever you want to do, please do it through the school. 
Yes. No, the school has building, has land, has water, has electricity, has teachers, has community, and they'll be your partners. No better partner. Yeah. You've achieved so much in so many different areas of your life over the last 50, 60 years. It's incredible. And we just wonder what keeps you inspired and energized and going all these oh, years. I, I enjoy what I do. Mm. You know, some people who are addicted to drugs, I guess I'm addicted to work and making change. I enjoy it. I, I never use the word people say, oh, you must feel proud. I said, no, I'm just delighted it didn't fail. <laughs> so I, I enjoy doing this and we'll just keep on going. Well, that's amazing. And thank you from all of us in the world. <laughs> you've done so much good for so many. Thank you. Well, come out, come out. But you've come on, we can sit down and do things and ask questions. You can yeah. bring people from certain countries who are interested here and, and go through it. That sounds like a good start. We cannot thank you enough for joining us today. We are so grateful that you took the time. Thank you very much, Michai. Thank you yes, very much so indeed. For both incredible. You. Well, that's it for this edition of the Overpopulation Podcast. Visit populationbalance.org to learn more and to share feedback or guest recommendations. Write to us using the contact form on our site or by emailing us at podcast at populationbalance.org. You might also be interested in joining our virtual podcast club, which meets monthly on Saturday over Zoom to discuss the ideas in a previous podcast episode. Learn more by visiting our website. And if you feel inspired by our work, please consider supporting us using the donate button. Until next time, I'm Nandita Bajaj, thanking you for your interest in our work and for all of your efforts in sustaining our beautiful life-giving planet.